Hey guys, welcome to the Cloud Developer Channel. In today's video, I'm going to talk about uh, Azure Functions. Azure Functions is a feature that exists within Azure that is essentially allowing you to build small and single purpose type of uh, features or, or functions as they're called uh, to be able to perform a, a particular operation and be able to execute it and uh, allow you to move on to the next step. Uh, one of the good use cases for this is being able to, for example, go out and read a file, uh, go maybe reach out to another website, another API uh, service, perform a call out to that service and be able to respond to it. And the benefit of uh, using Azure Functions is in that it's a software as a service platform. You basically don't need to worry about having a virtual machine. You don't need to worry about having a server. You don't need to uh, worry about scaling it out. Um, and you also have the full power of multiple de development languages. Uh, as an example, right now I'm on the Azure products and detail website. And you can see that it supports uh, the ability to use PowerShell, uh, JavaScript, PHP, C Sharp, um, and a few other languages such as F Sharp, uh, Python, things like that. Um, the, the neat thing about this as well is, is that you can actually set up uh, multiple plans um, to be able to uh, execute and pay for this service. One of those is pay as you go model. So basically, you'll only be charged for the amount of time that the server is actually executing that given function. So if they're very short lived, uh, you'll actually not be charged very much. In fact, they actually do um, sub um, sub second billing. So if your function takes three milliseconds to execute, you'll only be billed for that. Um, also. Uh, you have an option of being able to put it in what's called an app service plan, uh, which basically means that if you have uh, a standard app service plan, uh, you can actually attach your functions to that plan. And what this will do is it will make sure that you're you're not actually getting billed multiple times. In fact, you'll be only billed for that application server instance where you can actually host multiple functions if you wanted to. Um, you can also host things like other web apps applications on that same uh, app service plan as well. And you can uh, do a few different things with these uh, functions. You can uh, have functions execute on a timer. Um, you can actually have them be executed based on certain events. So for example, if somebody made a call out uh, using REST API to that function, um, it can perform whatever you want it to perform, and then it will return a response, or you could just have it set up in a fire forget mode. Um, so if you just want to trigger other external calls, you can also integrate with other API services. You can even do things like uh, tie a particular function to something like uh, a record being stored in a queue inside of the Azure queue uh, in your storage account and be able to process events. So as an example, if you want to build a complex process, um, you can actually have a queue that a function puts a message onto, and you can then have another function that gets triggered based on the record being created in that queue. And it can do things like maybe uh, put that information into a table, uh, go make another API call, and so on. And you can daisy chain them like that to build a very complex business process if you wanted to. Um, and there's many other advantages of using something like this. Um, so if you start thinking about um, IoT scenarios where you have uh, thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of devices out there and they're just periodically checking in, you can actually build an Azure function to be able to serve as an endpoint to gather all that information and then uh, write it out to another endpoint in the back end for your processing. So. Let me actually show you uh, how to actually get started with this and what does it mean to build a very simple uh, Azure function that allows you to uh, receive some input uh, and you can actually produce an output as well using uh, your browser essentially. So let's actually uh, go ahead and go to our dashboard and in here uh, we see we have this uh, function apps and right now we don't actually have anything deployed. Now, uh, in order to actually get this deployed, let's go ahead and click on the plus here and we'll just type in function and click function app, hit create. 
we'll give it a name. So in this case, I'll just call it Cloud Developer IO Funk. I'll use an existing resource group. And uh, here's where you get to choose if you want to do consumption plan or an app service plan. I'm going to go ahead and stick with the consumption plan. And then I'm going to put it in the East US location. And the storage account, I'll go use an existing one that I actually have created for um, for this particular Azure Functions. So I won't turn on any application insights. I'll go ahead and hit Create. And let's give it a moment for it to actually set everything up in the background. Okay, so as you can see that the deployment succeeded. And I'll go ahead and navigate to all resources again. And uh, you can see that it showed up right here. And I'll go ahead and click on that. So uh, the first thing you'll notice is that uh, it comes up uh, right here on the left-hand side. You'll see uh, a grouping for functions, those proxies, and slots. Um, if this is your initial entry point into your um, your Azure Functions. So you'll see that there is a specific URL for it. It will tell you uh, the plan that is being used um, and as well as a couple other things. So another important thing is we have these overview and platform features tabs. So if we click on the platform features, you'll see that you have function app settings. So if you click on that, you can configure some settings specific to uh, this particular function application. So as an example, you can actually set a daily usage. Um, so we'll go ahead and, for example, set it to one gigabyte. So this will uh, make sure that if you start reaching the, um, the one gigabyte threshold for how much data is actually uh, being used, so it will actually stop your function from working until the, the following day, which is going to be 0, 0, uh, 0 uh, a.m. UTC. Um, you can also uh, enable and disable the, the proxy settings here, uh, the editor mode, uh, how you want to do it, and uh, a few other features. So we'll go ahead and exit out of this tab. Another uh, option you have here is the application settings. And in here is where you can change things like if you're planning to use C Sharp or F Sharp, you can specify the .NET Framework version. Uh, also, if you want to use 32-bit or 64 and a few other things. Um, another important thing to note is that you have this app settings section. This is basically for .NET developers. If they're familiar, if you're familiar with .NET development, you'll uh, be able to actually use the section to be able to access, just like you would uh, be able to access your configuration settings. Um, you uh, basically that are stored in the app config or web config. You'll be able to actually access them in the same way here. So you would just add a key here and put the value, and you'll be able to access it in your function. Um, so I think this is a pretty handy way of being able to store secret information that you don't have to publish inside of your function, especially if you're doing version controlling of those functions. So let's go back. Um, there's also a few other options that uh, you can um, browse through this and notice that there's SSL configurations. You can give it a specific DNS name. You can also configure authentication in here as well. So if you want people to authenticate to this Azure function before they actually start making API calls, you could do that in here as well. And then uh, things like being able to configure course. Uh, so in this particular case, if you actually have applications that are making JavaScript calls, you would actually want to be able to set this up here to allow those different endpoints to uh, to make calls out uh, to this particular endpoint for your Azure function to work correctly. Um, another important thing to, to be aware of is there's this console. And basically what this uh, can help you do is be able to actually manage your functions as well. So in here you can see that there's only one host.json file. But let's go ahead and actually create a new function real quick. And um, we'll see how this can be actually used. So I'll go ahead and uh, click this plus sign here. I'll go ahead and say that I'm going to want to, uh, well, actually, I'll just go choose custom here. So in here, it basically gives you uh, a few different templates uh, that you can choose from. So in this case, I'm going to be creating a plain C sharp function. And it gives you a few examples that you can actually start with. So, for example, if you wanted to do an HTTP trigger uh, using C Sharp, and it, uh, whenever it receives a request, it can actually act on that request and respond. 
you can have a manual trigger, you can have triggers based on timer, blob triggers, things like that. So in this case, uh, I'm going to just go ahead and uh, choose the HTTP trigger. I'll give it a name. And I'll just call it Rust Test. And um, authorization level here is what controls how people can actually ask, access your function. So the options that you have are function level, anonymous, and administrative. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and choose anonymous. I don't really need authentication in this case. Um, and uh, if you're interested in authentication uh, or securing your functions so that people who are unauthorized are not able to use it, uh, in this case, you could actually um, go ahead and set it to function level. And what this will do is it will actually uh, ask uh, or to make sure that in the URL when it's being invoked, that it is asking you for an API key. So you have to actually provide an API key in order to invoke the function. But in this case, I don't actually want to do that. So I'll go ahead and just create this function using anonymous. So what you'll notice here is it actually pre-populated my function and I can go ahead and start making changes to it. Now let's actually first see if we can run this and see what the output is. So I'll go ahead and click run here. And you'll notice that I actually executed and completed already. So, and the output is hello Azure. So what this actually did is it uh, received the request uh, as a HTTP request. It uh, passed in the HTTP request message and the trace uh, writer. This is how we actually are able to write into the log files. And uh, you can see that right here. So when we do log.info, C sharp HTTP trigger function passed. Um, a request, we can actually see that it shows up right here. Now, um, let's say we actually wanted to uh, log some information to it, so, you know, related to the actual name. So we can actually do something like this. And then uh, if I go ahead and save it, it actually will automatically compile it. You can see it actually finished. And then if I run it, um, I should be able to see that the, uh, the user uh, was supposed to actually pass something in, but I didn't actually get anything in here. So, um, and actually the reason for that is because I uh, am not getting the information from the query parameter, but I'm actually getting it from the body of, of the of the request. So I just need to move this down a little bit and save that again and run this. And you can see that the user passed Azure, which is uh, what this value right here is. And I can pass in whatever I want to. And if I go ahead and run that again, you can see that a different value got passed in and you can see the output right here. So it's pretty simple. And uh, another thing you can actually do here is you can click on this get function URL and you can copy this value here. And let's go ahead and actually run this in the browser. And if we make this call, you'll notice that it actually uh, gives me a response back saying, please pass name on the query string or in the request body. So in this case, because I'm using a browser, um, and I'm not passing anything in query string. That's why it's giving that message because this is doing the HTTP get. So an uh, easy way to fix that is I'll just do a question mark name equals uh, developer.io. And when I do that, uh, it will come back and actually tell me, you know, hello called developer.io or whatever I end up putting in here in the URL. So it's uh, pretty simple to actually get this working. Um, things that you can actually do in here are uh, things like this. So, for example, if you wanted to rename your function, um, you know, looking at this, I didn't actually see an easy way to actually rename that given function. But uh, one thing that I discovered is that when you actually go to the console, you'll see that uh, the folder name exists like this. And basically, every function gets its own folder. So if you go to that folder, we can actually see the content of that. And it just has basically a couple of files in here. So if I actually uh, uh, go up to the root of the folder again, uh, what we can do is we can actually just say run rename uh, and rest test to testing rest. And if I go ahead and go back to this uh, place right here, I'll hit refresh. 
and then you'll see that it will switch to testing rest. So that is uh, how simple it is to actually make a, a change to uh, to the function itself. And then you can also see that the actual name of the URL uh, or the URL itself changed as well to reflect that. So if I can uh, go ahead and run it here. So actually, let me just change this right here. Let's see, I just called it testing rest. And you can see everything is still working. So um, another thing uh, that uh, you might be interested in is this uh, area right here. So there's an integrate um, menu option. Um, and this is uh, how you actually bind the parameters to your function. So if you go back to the function, you'll notice that the first argument that we get here is the HTTP request message with a, a variable named req. And then there's a uh, trace writer dot log. If we go to the integrate uh, menu option, you'll see that HTTP req is actually the trigger point for this. So you can also do things like uh, actually select a specific method. So in case you know that you're always getting uh, HTTP GET, you can actually limit it just to the HTTP GET. And then you also can rename the variable name here, and you can also change the authentic authorization level. So I'll go ahead and save that here. Um, another thing you can actually do is you can actually bind it uh, to certain types of inputs as well as outputs. So in this case, uh, the inputs options that are available are Azure Blob Storage, um, Azure Table Storage, uh, Cosmos DB, mobile tables, and there's uh, two that are in the experimental state. Um, now, when you talk about the outputs, uh, you can actually use a few more options uh, to be able to uh, generate the output to be able to send data uh, to another endpoint. So, for example, if you wanted to uh, store information inside of an Azure uh, queue or Azure Blob Storage, you would actually end up choosing this. Uh, click and select and you would give it uh, a few parameters so for example you would give it the name of the parameter that you want to use in your function um, the path to the actual blob that you want to be using and then in here you would actually click new and it would ask you what storage account you want to use so in this case i, I have this storage account um, that i created so i'll go ahead and choose that and one of the things this will actually do is it will update your uh, function application settings um, to be able to actually uh, reference it in, in your um, in your function. So if I go back to my cloud developer functions main area and I go to application settings, you'll actually notice uh, that under the app settings section, uh, we now have the cloud developer func uh, store storage, and it will give me the connection string that uh, was actually created in order to to use this uh, reference. So um, another thing that uh, is important is this is where you actually can specify the function keys. This is uh, enabled for authentication purposes. So if you want to add a new function key, you can go ahead and click a new function key, give it the name you want to use, and then uh, provide the value. Uh, or in this case, it actually uh, will generate a new value if you don't actually provide anything, just leave it empty. So uh, I'm not using that right now, so I'm just going to go ahead and skip that. And then under the monitoring uh, tab, what you'll see is your ability to actually see how many times that the actual function executed. So let's actually go ahead and refresh this real quick. And you'll notice that um, so far it actually got executed once um, in this particular case. And this is uh, slightly delayed. This is not actually, um, you know, live data. Um, so it, it takes a, a few moments for it to actually show up in this list. But then when you click on it, you can actually see the data that um, was generated. So you can see the actual URL that was being used. Um, you can see the context, you can see the actual um, fact that there was a response generated, and you can see the associated log information about this. Now, also, if you actually want to see more metrics uh, or information about the actual query that was being executed, you can also enable uh, Azure Application Insights and be able to start monitoring. Now, in the next video, I actually um, am going to go through an exercise of how to take these Azure functions and start integrating them into something like an AngularJS application. Um, and what I'm thinking of doing is maybe building a simple uh, counter 
that allows me to actually send a message to this uh, function that allows me to actually capture the fact that somebody loaded the page. Um, it will actually write the information to either a blob storage account or a table and then we'll be able to use another function that will be able to actually tell us what's the current count. So uh, watch out for that video uh, next and if you have any questions go ahead and leave your feedback in the comment section below and I will talk to you next time.